All right, well, we may as well get started. Um, as is pretty typical with me, I've got like a ton of stuff to get through. Um, this is, like, I, I do sermons now and then, but this is not going to be a sermon. It is going to be more of a lecture classroom type format. Um, I say that to let you know that I do have a certain direction that I'm wanting it to go, but as with pretty much all classroom teachers, if someone wants to throw it off in a different direction by asking questions, I'll probably take the bait and we'll end up going somewhere else. So um, I do have a rough plan, um, but we'll see how we go with it. If there's time at the end, we'll do some questions if you're into that. And um, I really do encourage you to come back for the second session. Um, the second session is not going to be me lecturing or talking or anything like that. It's going to be mainly practical and you doing stuff the whole time. And you'll be able to hopefully put what we do in this session to work. So if you want to get the most out of it, I encourage you to um, come to both. But and at the same time, I don't want to be super like desperate and <laughs> all that. Yeah, do we want? Um, <laughs> cool. So. Um, First thing we're going to do, I want to actually start off with a bit of interaction from yourself. So if you look under your chair, you will see a paper and two pens. Hopefully they're um, they are a colour that you're into. Yes. I want us to um, basically try and work in pairs or in a group of three. Feel free to um, you know pair up with someone you don't know. Who knows? You might meet your future husband or wife doing it. Um, but basically, I want you to answer two questions. Uh, so I'm literally, I'm, I'll time it even. I'm literally going to give you like two minutes. So I want you to throw down, maybe you could like, you know, draw a line down the middle of the paper, divide it in two. I want you to, I want you to, what's that? That's up to you, Mike. You're free to do the table. I would do it. Um, so the first question I want you to, Basically, just pop down everything you know about um, is what is biblical theology. So have a go at that on one side, and then on the other side, I want you to put who is the author of the Bible, and be as specific as you need. So the first side is what is biblical theology. I mean, we came to talk on biblical theology, so hopefully that's interesting to you to some degree. Hopefully, you know, I, I do know most of the people in this room, so hopefully you're not like, oh, Phil's doing the talk, let's rock up. Hopefully, there's some interest in it. Um, so, what do you know about it? And then the second part, who's the author of the Bible? I'll start the plot. Sweet. Okay, so I, I want to bring this back to you. Um, so, if you feel like you've got something worth contributing, um, maybe you're super confident and you just want to throw it out there, Let, let's do that first one. What is biblical theology? Let's hear some thoughts. It's a safe space. <laughs> yeah. Would it be a, um, a more thematic approach to understanding the world? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Really good. Anything, anyone got anything else to add to that? Sweet. So good. All right, and the second one, uh, who is the author of scripture? What have we got for that? But more of a tricky one. Yeah. Holy Spirit. Nice. Okay. Cool, and that's absolutely true, and I, I definitely affirm that and agree with that. Is there any more we could add to the question, or to the answer rather? Yeah. I'll say God through uh, inspired authors. A whole bunch of people. Sweet. So I basically just want to really quickly talk about what I'm assuming in terms of both of these questions as we go into um, this talk and explore some of these things. And I think the best way to, yeah, to do that up front is say, what I'm assuming, um, what the premises are as we go into it, and you'll kind of understand this world thought if, if we do it that way. So, um, absolutely, uh, when we talk about biblical theology, we're talking, it is a thematic approach to scripture. Um, it's very important to note that when we talk about biblical theology, we're not saying theology that is biblical. Or it's at least not just that. Hopefully, biblical theology <laughs> will, will be biblical, if you get what I mean. What I'm trying to clarify as I say this is there are actually multiple categories of theology, and hopefully all of them will be being biblical. So um, we, we can speak of theology in terms of historical theology, which is, okay, Christ has been building his church for 2,000 years so far. Um, so when we look at topic A, um, let's say salvation, 
how has the church thought about this? How have different thinkers over the, over the course of church history who have interacted with the Bible, how have they answered this question? How have they thought about this? How have they reasoned about this? That's what we call historical theology. I'm actually, that's what I'm doing my degree in this year, and so I'm like, this is based, I'm totally stepping out of my zone <laughs> right now, jumping into a different field, but I'll have a crack at it. Um, systematic theology as well, we're talking about like logically, I guess, interacting with scripture and um, forming, I guess, like systematic categories that we can take away and easily apply into life. Um, we also kind of address questions in systematic theology that aren't, you won't be able to find one verse that says this is how it exactly works. One example of systematic theology would be how do you put together a doctrine of the Trinity? Are you going to be able to find one verse that says, okay, the Trinity, if we're talking about a God, one essence, three persons, equal in rank, you won't find a single verse that says that, but we're kind of logically applying, okay, well, this text over here must mean this, and this text over here must mean this. So when we put this together and reason about it, well, it, it seems to come out with um, the Trinity. You don't really do that so much in biblical theology. Another one is um, natural theology, which is in terms of if you're into like creation science, um, that's one way that that uh, manifests itself. But we're talking about knowing God through the created order. Since God made the world, his stamp is all over the world. So you're going to see things that you can realize about God through interacting with the created order. So those, those are the other three. And then biblical theology, we're talking about the story of Scripture. We're talking about how does the story of Scripture um, flow as it goes? What is the story that God is trying to communicate through this, through this whole um, book? And what is the development of some of these themes as we move over time? Because scripture tends to um, progressively re reveal more about what, what God's plan is as it, as it moves along. Um, so basically we're talking about the story of scripture. The story of scripture being um, what is God doing in the world uh, with a particular people redeemed through his son Jesus Christ and what is God revealing about that. So that is what we're getting at when we talk about biblical theology. One thing that I always think, and probably if you're following me, some of you will be thinking is, surely there's overlap between the four. And def that's definitely true. There, there are, there's definitely overlap between the four. You can make one of those like mega Venn diagram memes uh, or whatever, and that's totally legitimate to do. And mostly when you're trying to answer a question about what does God think about this, or what does the Bible say about that, you hopefully would delve into all four. Um, so, of course, there's going to be overlap. Um, so, talking about some things I'm assuming as I come into this, um, and this is dealing with the second question, the first one being that the Bible is the Word of God. So, I believe that the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments are God's Word. In every individual word, not just in the thoughts, but in the actual words, I believe God intended each actual word to be there, and we can read scripture out loud or read it quietly at home and say, I have just encountered the word of God today. Um, so, so I believe that. Um, in saying that, though, number two, uh, and I know this beautifully pointed out by some of you, um, both God and man are the author of scripture. Um, there is a view of scripture which basically says um, all of scripture is like the Ten Commandments. Basically, God inscribed it on a rock, and it, he just kind of wrote it and there it is and he didn't really use human vessels or human instruments to bring it about it's just there and um, that's what we have today uh, another view which is kind of like going way to the other extreme basically says okay well, the holy spirit works with human beings and they have right thoughts about god because the holy spirit's going to help them know true things and then they write down the true thoughts about god and that's what the bible is so whether the exact words on the page are exactly what God wanted in the Bible is neither here nor there. They would say, oh, yeah, it's, it's saying pretty much true stuff. There could be the old mistake in it because the guy worded it so weird and um, didn't really word it exactly how God was communicating it, but the gist is pretty much right. So there are people that would say that. And I think what the biblical view, if you go through the Bible, um, that pre presents itself is that the best bits of both of those views are true and they kind of come into line, which is this. Every single... Uh, word in the Bible in the original manuscript is from God and it was what God intended to be there. Not just the thoughts behind it, but the actual words themselves. On the other hand, we do have to acknowledge um, there's clearly different personalities coming out in the scripture, right? If you read Paul, it's not like reading Song of Solomon. You read both, not the same thing. You read Revelation, it's not like reading Genesis. You read Matthew, it's not like reading um, John. 
so that, so clearly the personalities of the different writers come out and, and um, that is something that is happening there so with that in mind number three it's okay to talk about the bible as one book even though it's made up of many books right so it's appropriate to talk about this as a unit um, we have to talk about obviously the diversity of scripture do you know what i mean when i said the diversity of scripture that it is made up of 66 books and they're from different time periods and they're from different authors we clearly have to talk about the diversity of scripture but i feel like sometimes we can so often talk about that that we miss the unity of scripture that there's one god behind it every word is there from god and he has one agenda that he's bringing about with this book <coughs> Um, which possibly an individual author may not have known the whole stuff of, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself there. Um, number four, the Bible's telling one story. Obviously, that follows if it's one unit. Um, number five, Jesus Christ is the point of the whole story. And then number six, which I want to basically, everything I'm going to say is going to flow out of this, the whole Bible should be read with that in mind. Um, I do have a picture here as an analogy of it, mm -hmm. uh, the marble. Um, we've got Marvel Cinematic Universe. I've, I've, I'm, I've been married five years, and so when these were sort of getting off the ground, um, I got super behind because my wife has no interest in these. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've got some faithful friends who've kind of slowly been taking me through them, and I'm pretty well put up. I think I've seen them all now. That is not a perfect analogy, and if you want to sling some accusations at me, yeah, there are definitely places where it breaks down. But the idea being, there's a whole bunch of different movies, but they're all with. I guess a few people having one idea in mind about where the entire thing is going. Do you follow the analogy? I mean, obviously, yeah. there's bits where it doesn't. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't write blogs about me. Um, but, yeah, okay. Cool. So, this is sort of the outline of where we're going. What is biblical theology? Why should we read the Bible in this way? I want to address a couple of problems that um, people have with this approach to reading the Bible. And then I want to finish with some examples of this from Matthew's Gospel, and hopefully there'll be time for some questions. What time do we finish? Quarter past four, is it? So it's about half an hour. All right. Um, yeah, so do some biblical theology in Matthew's Gospel, and then hopefully we'll take some questions. I might be being ambitious, though. Okay, so if you're taking notes or you want to turn to um, some scriptures, here are a few. Why should the Bible be read in this way? I'm making the case that all of scripture should be read in light of Jesus Christ, and the, the significance of every text of the Bible is to make you know about Jesus Christ and some aspect of his work, some aspect of his life, some aspect of his ministry, some aspect of his accomplishments and what that means for you. All of the Bible should be read in light of that. Now, a really obvious thing that people could say, and I certainly would have said this for a long time, is, uh, hello, Jesus only came in, like, Matthew, if you're reading it in the order of Scripture. So what about all the books that are there? Um, before Jesus. Are you saying you want to read Jesus into a, a text that doesn't even mention Jesus? Furthermore, you have uh, books of the Bible like Esther, which don't even mention God by name. So that seems like a real stretch. What are you going to say? Read about Jesus in there. Um, yes, that's, that's what I'm saying. All of Scripture should be read in light of Christ. So a few um, texts that I, I want to just point us to that I think bear this out. So first one, 2 Timothy 3.15. Paul is writing to Timothy, and if, if you know the chapter well he's encouraging him um, in the midst of the i guess turbulent times in the last days uh, he says in second timothy 3 1 that um timothy needs to stick with the scriptures he needs to um uh, minister and explain and lead people from the scriptures because they're the only things that are god breathed he's going to say in the next verse in, in verse 16 so but in verse 15 paul is calling uh, Timothy back to his childhood where obviously he was raised by a godly mother and a godly grand grandmother um, Paul says to Timothy in, in his writings and so from childhood he has been uh, familiar with the scripture now what is a scripture that Timothy would have been familiar with as he was raised around this time of the New Testament well it wasn't Ephesians it wasn't 2 Timothy right it wasn't Revelation it was Isaiah it was the Pentateuch um, so he says, from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So the idea being that if you're reading the scriptures correctly, talking about the Old Testament scriptures, what they are doing, the, the goal of them is to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. John 5, 38 uh, to 40, 
Jesus is arguing with some of the Jews who are rejecting him, and he condemns their knowledge of the scripture, but their failure to do with it what is appropriate. Uh, Jesus says this, you do not have his word abiding in you. And then notice the connection here between the next clause. For, so the way Jesus knows this, is you do not believe the one whom he has sent. The implication there being, if you were reading the word rightly, you'd believe in the one whom he has sent. Yet here you are contradicting me. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it's they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So he expects them to get this from the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, Luke 24 verse 27, this is the Emmaus Road encounter um, after the resurrection. There's a couple of despondent, um, pretty gutted disciples who expected Jesus to do great things, and then he ends up um, not taking victory in the way that you would expect, ends up being crucified, and they're unaware of his resurrection at this point. They happen to walk down a road and have a Bible study with Jesus, which, like, super, super jealous of that. Um, it would have been a really show up there. Um, but we can kind of guess probably what he said. So this is how this is what Jesus spoke to them about. Luke 24, 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Um, Acts 10, 43, uh, this is Peter here talking. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So if you're reading the prof prophetic writings correctly, right, so Isaiah, through the end of the, the Old Testament canon, the message you should be getting from that is that everyone who believes in the Messiah receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That's the message. And then this last one's of particular importance. So if you've kind of been zoning out, just try try to join me a bit on this one. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Paul says, all of the promises of God are yes in Christ. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, God makes promises to redeem and restore and, um, I guess, fix the human problem that has come in through the fall, as was discussed in the talk last night, for those of you that were there. And um, that happens in a, in a range of different contexts, one of which, I mean, a major one of which is Old Testament Israel. And Ephesians 2 will talk about how Gentiles, which, which presumably all of us are, were up until Christ came cut off from the commonwealth of Israel and were not included in the promises of God, but through Christ we've now been brought near. And because of that, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says, all of the promises of God are yes in Christ. Now, this is, this is huge. This should, if, you, if you're anything like me and have any background like me, this should revolutionize the way you read the Bible. Because the way I basically read it was to go, okay, who's this promise directed to? Maybe you're reading the Old Testament. Um, maybe you're at like a camp and people are sharing their devotions or whatever, and someone does like a nice verse like this classic like Jeremiah 21, we all know this verse. We're in the same story here. And smart old me sitting in the corner, I know the deal. Look at the context. For I know the plans I have for you. Who's the you? Well, it's actually written to Israel in exile, right? Well, guess what? I'm not an Israelite. And I'm also not an exile. So I was like, well, this verse is clearly relevant to me. It's, it has no bearing on me. Um, I'm just reading at the moment Joshua, Joshua chapter 2, where another classic verse that Christian kids learn, be strong and courageous, for I'm with you. I go, well, okay, yeah, that's the context of what it's talking about. Storming a bunch of cities in the land of Canaan, um, pillaging and, and taking the land. Well, I'm not just coming out of Egypt. I'm not taking real estate for myself. I'm not about to get into some big battles. So clearly, when someone tries to take this verse and encourage me in my Christian life to be strong and courageous for I'm with you, that's clearly relevant to me, right? So what you end up doing if you don't read the Bible in light of Christ is you cut off a massive amount of the Bible. You can't preach it. You can't read it. You can't apply it to yourself because that's to them, not to me. But what 2 Corinthians 1 20 says is the promises of God are yes in Christ. Okay, so you are now included through Christ into all of the promises of God that are that are in the Old Testament even. So it's it's right to take Jeremiah 29 11 to yourself. It's right to take Joshua 2 to yourself. It's right to take all of them to yourself. Now there's ways that that's going to be done, and I'm sure I'm sure there's questions, but it's a it's you're on the right track to be doing that because all of those are yes to you in Christ. Okay. So 
couple problems I want to raise. First problem is this. Aren't you saying the Bible isn't clear then? And the way that that is typically asked is to say something like this. Well, surely there's no better way to understand a passage from the Old Testament scripture than, number one, to what the author himself was conscious that he was saying, right? You, you, you with me? Or what the original audience would have understood him to be saying. Okay? So the, the way to read the Bible surely is, okay, what is, what's the original author saying? What's he conscious of the fact that he's saying? And what would the audience at the time have picked up that he was saying? And aren't, that sounds good to me. That sounds reasonable. Like you don't want to be putting words in the mouth of somebody who, who's not trying to say that. But wouldn't you, by this, be doing that? You get what I'm saying? Because if, if I want to say that Joshua 2 is actually about Jesus' promises for you, or if I want to say Jeremiah 29 11 is now for you, or if I want to say all these Old Testament passages are actually about Jesus, and the, the author wasn't conscious that how I'm taking it now is how you should be taking it, aren't I saying the Bible isn't clear? So that, that's a problem that is raised. I don't think that's a good problem. I think that's a fair question, and it, it's brought up a lot. So I, I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, the way that I think is helpful to think through this is being really precise and careful in what we mean when we talk about the meaning of a biblical passage. So someone could say, are you saying Jeremiah 29 11 means that through Christ you are now one of God's people and even though you're a Gentile not living at that time, that God knows the plans he has for you, uh, declares the Lord, plans not to harm you but to prosper you, to give you a hope in the future. Are you saying that means that a 27-year-old in the year 2020 can take that and apply it to his life? Well, let's, let's go with this framework and let's see how we go. I would say it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. What does it mean? Well, it means that the Jews in exile for 70 years that Jeremiah is talking to, uh, God is for them and he knows the plans he has for them. That's what it means. But in light of the, the, the whole of Scripture, in light of the, the one book that the Bible is, does that have any significance through Christ beyond just the limited time period that it's talking about? So we talk with this framework of meaning and significance. What's the meaning of a text? When we talk about the meaning, this, this is what I'm meaning when I say meaning, is that what did the original author mean to communicate and what did the original audience seek to get from that? That's the meaning, okay? But on top of meaning, in light of scripture as we go, there's, there's actually significance that comes out that can be greater than what the original author was aware of and was greater than what the original audience were even aware of that we can only know now from looking back. So there's significance. Now the, the question comes in, okay, let's say in doing a Bible study, let's say you're doing your devotion or your, your, your quiet times at home, let's say someone's preaching a sermon, is it okay then in that passage to talk about the significance of that passage rather than the meaning? Or to, to make it more balanced, is it appropriate to spend more time on the significance than on the meaning? Probably you want to talk about the meaning to some degree. But is it okay to kind of jump from there and go to the significance? And that's what basically I'm saying. Some people, when they talk about meaning, are talking about like both of those. And so you kind of get these really heated debates sort of in Christian circles. Like, you say it means this, you say it means this, and you just, it's like ships passing in the night because we're meaning a different thing by meaning. So we have to be careful in what we're meaning with that. So meaning and significance, <laughs> you follow what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's basically how I see those fitting together. I think that's a, a good um, way to take into account the data there. Um, Edmund Clowney says, it's possible to know Bible stories yet miss the Bible story. So it's possible to sit in a passage like David and Goliath and say, okay, there was a guy called David, he was small, there was a guy called Goliath, he was big, David fought Goliath, and that's really cool. Move on. <laughs> well, that is almost useless. <laughs> and then we jump up a step from that and we go, okay, okay, now I get how this works. You, you've seen this, all the guys on Facebook do this. I'm David. <laughs> and you know where I'm going to go with this. I'm not going to steal my channel soon. Um, but that's what we do. Okay. Yeah. Noah was a good man. God saw that Noah was a righteous man in, uh, in the midst of his generation, so God saved him. So what do we do from that? Well, we can stop at, that's a nice story. Or we can move from there to, okay, I've got to be good which 
is also not possible either. Because if the framework that we're given from the New Testament is actually this is about Jesus, if you skip Jesus when you talk about love, you're missing the point. So you have to talk about the meaning and the significance of it. Okay, what's the time at? 3.58. Sweet. I'm just going to say Okay. Problem number two. Aren't you giving license to do anything? Aren't you giving people license to do anything they want with the Bible? So if you're saying, okay, this needs to be read in light of Christ. Well, as I read this in the grammar and what the author seems to be communicating, that's not talking about Christ. So aren't you just saying people can just sort of, you know, just jump in there? And you've seen this. Like, this is a huge problem in evangelical Christian churches at the moment. You can just go into a, a, into a church somewhere and someone will just get up and they'll take a, a verse, completely rip it from its context, somehow apply it to being about you. And you, like, have you ever felt that, I think, like holy skepticism and holy cynicism where you're just like, really, bro? Like, mm-hmm. it seems like you're stretching this beyond belief. Like, I, I, don't, I don't see that at all. So, am I, am I basically just giving credence to that and say, yeah, just go for it. Whatever you come up with, it's sweet. And no, I'm not. There are, there are rules, there are ways it's to be done. First of all, I refer you again to the answer to the first problem, but there are more things to say um, beyond this. So how is this to be done? But that's what I want to talk about here. Okay, so these are, yeah, I totally fixed that PowerPoint, and another one is wrong here. Imagine the second one is two, and so forth. <laughs> ah, drink. So the first one we're talking about is typology. Does anyone know? Does anyone here know what typology is? Cool. All right. So typology is basically um, things in the history of scripture, uh, and you'll see about like the events, people, offices, and institutions that you see forming a pattern, and that by virtue of them both existing and then there being a pattern that you're observing indirectly prophesy something that is going to come about now there's debates about whether you could have known this before christ came or now that christ has come you look back and, and you see that that's what it was even though it wasn't aware uh, you weren't aware of it at the time i'm not really interested in getting into that uh, but typology is basically there are events people offices and institutions that in some way are uh, a shadow to use that language of the of the substance that christ will be later when he comes things that point to the ultimate fulfillment of what the story of the Bible is about, which is Christ. So we can talk about this um, with events. So one example of an event that is, I guess, typological would be um, the flood. So you know the flood story where God floods the world and there's this ark and it can save you from the flood, etc., etc. And then you come along to this time later in the New Testament, draws us out really well that actually that's kind of similar to the situation that we're in now that there are um i guess people who speak on behalf of god you know screaming out into the simple uh realm that judgment is coming it's coming soon and even though um, i've been warning you for a while and it hasn't happened yet and you've never seen everything kind of um, come to an end like this um it is coming and it's it's typological it's and it's an event that's pointing to another event that that's a greater um version of it associated with Christ. Another one could be like the Exodus, right? The book of Revelation will talk about um, those in Christ going through like a second Exodus and it will constantly draw themes out of that that, um, in the same way that the people are saved from slavery and Pharaoh through plagues, etc. That in a a heightened way, in a bigger way, um, that is happening, that's happening through Christ. Um, There's there's a lot we can talk about. Another one is people. So there are people uh, in the Old Testament that in a small, limited way um, point to Christ and, and point to his work. Um, so, for example, a, a person there that uh, points to Christ. Uh, in, in Romans 5, Adam is described as a type of Christ. Um, so you, you'll remember last night it, w- it was discussed that when Adam sinned, and used the analogy of sinning like COVID-19, it's a virus that kind of infects beyond yourself, right? And, and the language uh, that Genesis uses as it goes into Genesis 5 with the genealogy there, death is passed down 
the line because sin is basically showing sin is infecting everyone. So Adam does a sin, and then the, the guilt of his sin is imputed and, and basically given to everybody else. Some, a lot of people get this not quite right, by the way. They, they basically say you, you inherit a sin nature from Adam, which is true. Um, that, that's right, but it doesn't stop there. What, what um, Genesis is saying and what Romans 5 gets at is that you actually get the guilt from Adam, not just not just his sin nature, that's true, but God actually sees you as guilty of committing Adam's sin. It's imputed to you is the word. So anyway, Paul takes that in Romans 5 and he draws a he, he draws an analogy between Adam's giving you his guilt and Christ giving you his righteousness. So that in a way, Christ is the greater Adam who uh, gives you something that is not directly from you. Adam gives you sin, Christ gives you righteousness. You could talk about Jonah, the reluctant prophet who doesn't want to go into the city of Nineveh to share uh, the word of salvation with them. And you have Jesus, the very keen, eager prophet who goes in with joy at the cost of his own life to um, to give his life. So Jesus is like the greater Jonah. Um, offices. Um, so throughout the Old Testament as well, you have offices. So not, not just talking about individual people with stories in their lives, but there's offices that different people take up. So I'm thinking here in terms of things like prophets, priests, uh, kings, which the Protestant, um, basically in Protestant theology, we've typically called these the threefold offices of Christ, the, the prophet, the priest, and the king. Prophets, basically, um, we, we could go into the weeds on this, but we don't need to. Um, prophets bring the word of God to a, a rebellious people. People are in rebellion against God, they're breaking his commandments, and then for God to, I guess, call them back to who he would have them to be. He sends these prophets, all these different shapes and styles and methods, go in and they bring a message of God to the people. And they're imperfect and they frequently get it wrong. As I just said with Jonah, he's reluctant. He's got a really stink attitude. There's this incident where he gets a little bit distracted and goes a different way and has to come back. So Jesus is the greater prophet who fully reveals God, does it well, um, and there's no greater message of God's people after Jesus has come. Another office we have in the Old Testament is priests. Priests offer sacrifices on behalf of the people to atone for their sins before God. And then obviously Jesus fulfills that in a greater way by coming and offering a sacrifice, not of an animal, not of bulls and goats, but of himself. And so he's in a, this kind of strange picture, both the priest and then the sacrifice at the same time. He's the priest who offers himself, himself before God and in a way that is not repeated it, it's done so it's the greater it's always topology always moves to the greater fulfillment in christ um and another one could be judges if you read the book of judges who are they well israel is in the land they they are blessed by god and god is good to them and they get a little bit complacent let's say a little bit that's a huge euphemism if you read the book it's really bad <laughs> and they, they fall away from god and so god has these judges that kind of rise up and, and fix the situation well okay Judges, Jesus, Judges, well, Jesus is described, Acts 17, as the greater judge who's going to come and fix the situation, in the, not just in Israel, but in the whole world. Jesus is the true judge. So, well, who's Samson? Well, Samson was a judge. So, does Samson relate to Christ? Yeah, totally. He's pretty shoddy in a lot of ways. <laughs> but he is related to Christ as they fulfill the same office in different ways. Um, and then we're talking about institutions, so these are some fairly... Some are obvious, some are obvious. We're talking about the Passover. We're talking about um, the Israelites being led out of Egypt by the, the pillar of fire at night. You know the story? And then Jesus gets up at John 7 where there's a, a, a feast where they're celebrating that. And Jesus comes on and says, I'm the light of the world. Right? So when you read this narrative of the Israelites being led out of Egypt at night by this massive pillar of, sky, uh, of, sky, of fire in the sky, we're supposed to read that and go, okay, Jesus is the greater version of that in the same way that um, that led them out of the land. Jesus leads me out of this land. Jesus leads me into the new heavens and the new earth. And that's currently happening right now. And to read that passage and not dwell on how Jesus is the light of the world right now to us, I think it's just to miss um, the main point of scripture. Um, longitudinal themes. Thanks, brother, for bringing up the themes. So, are there ever times where biblical writers, prophets, kings, priests, whoever, are addressing themes, and then you can't read it, and you go, sheesh, someone else talked about this too, mm -hmm. right? Well, it's appropriate, I think, to link that in there. Frequently, the message is left unfinished in the Old Testament. 
there's, there's aspects of it missing. And, and I think the beauty of the Old Testament is you look at it and you go, oh, there's a problem here. Um, John Piper's used a really good analogy of um, some of these longitudinal themes. Um, he uses the analogy of like an orchestra that's playing two, um, there's like two motifs in the music and they kind of, they're both beautiful and they kind of fit, but there's also this tension in your mind. Like how, how does that, how does that fit? And then later on, they kind of resolve and that's what Christ brings in the New Testament. So frequently, like for example, if you read Ecclesiastes and what it says about like death and hopelessness and things like that, like themes like that come out in Christ's message. But if you just stop at Ecclesiastes and don't actually bring it to Christ, I, I don't think you've done justice to um, what the Old Testament is giving you at. Mm. Uh, number three, contrast. And this kind of goes back into this as well. Frequently there are times where you can contrast an action, event, an event, a teaching, an emphasis with what Christ does. So I kind of did that just then with Ecclesiastes. I kind of just did that just then with, um, I just did that with uh, Jonah, the, the reluctant the reluctant prophet. There's, because God is dealing with simple humans uh, and his purpose is leading up to Christ, there's always going to be ways where they butcher it and get it wrong and drive a wrong emphasis or not know enough and Christ doesn't have a problem. So you're going to be able to frequently draw contrast between them. And I think when you when you see the contrast between an Old Testament king and Christ the great king, I think it, it brings clarity to how wonderful and how good Christ's um, role as king actually is in a way that wouldn't have all of its beauty and, and multifaceted nature um, if you only talked about Christ in the New Testament. So, so um, why is First Kings in the Bible? Why is Second Kings in the Bible? You basically have a whole line like super depressing. If you haven't read First Kings, go read First Kings. It's just trash. Not like so depressing. You're like, oh my god, surely he's going to be a good guy. Like, yes, okay, well, it's it. Like, he's kind. Like, oh, well, that's yeah, it's okay. Yeah. And then he has a kid. He was trash again. Like, oh my god. Is there going to be a good king? That's what you're supposed to get from that. Is is someone going to come who's going to fix this? And I think unless you know that, you, you're not getting Christ out of that. Saul, terrible king. Ah, but a good king is coming. So there's contrast. Go back to Ecclesiastes. All of the hopelessness around death and meaninglessness. Is there contrast there? Is there an alternative message that Scripture's getting at that brings conclusion to that? Well, yeah. Jesus. It needs to talk about. Um, promise and fulfillment. So now we're talking about like explicit messianic prophecies. There are times in Scripture where actually, and this to talk, bring back the. You know that being the significance thing? I think, so everything I've said so far is kind of the significance one. This actually goes back to the meaning one, right? Because the actual meaning that he's trying to communicate is that there's a Messiah coming, and this is what he's going to be like, and this is where he's going to be born, and this is how it's going to go. Um, and yeah, so we've got to be looking at, does the Old Testament talk about it? If you read at, in the end of Deuteronomy, uh, sorry, middle of Deuteronomy, there's, a, there's talk about um, prophets and what you should do with false prophets who come in and, and they deceive the people. And then Moses says, one day a greater prophet is going to arise out of the people and you should, you should listen to him, right? Well, who's that? There's no, there's no need to guess about it. The book of Acts, Peter says it is Christ. So we should look at those and um, be aware of them and look to how they are fulfilled. Um, New Testament references. Does the New Testament ever quote this passage in the Old Testament? One thing that you should do, this is a little Bible reading tip that you should take up if you don't already, is whenever you're reading the New Testament and you come across an Old Testament reference, you should dig it up. Take a sec, dig it up, go find it in the Old Testament, and even if at the very least you just get a pen out and write the reference in the New Testament beside it. Just so the next time you read through the Old Testament, I'm assuming you read all the description, if you aren't, do it, it's really cool. Um, but assuming that you are, you'll get to it again and go, ah, oh, that's right, Jesus talked about it. Ah, that's right, Paul talked about this. Ah, James talked about this. And it just brings the way it's all unified together in a, in a way that's far better. You're like, I've never seen that. Okay, that's interesting. Or sometimes it's puzzling too, like, man, how are you getting that? That doesn't seem like what Hosea is talking about there. Um, Matthew, so, so what, are, what are you doing with that? So New Testament references, um, really important. And then analogies, I'm not going to bother with that one because it's kind of vague. And I think I'm running out of time, so about three minutes. Um, so I'm not just going to do it. Cool. Talk about pipes. Eh. Okay, no more PowerPoint. 
I'm going to do a little bit of biblical theology in three minutes <laughs> about Matthew's gospel. Okay. So, just as, as an example of how this is done, in subtle ways sometimes, that you need to be aware of. Okay. So, how is the Old Testament moving towards Christ in the thinking and in the writing and the theology of Matthew? Well, let, let's look at a few. Number one, in Matthew 1 verse 21, uh, when the angel's speaking to Mary, she says his name should be called Jesus or he'll save his people from their sins. And you're probably aware that the Jews that were hanging out with Jesus in his life didn't call Jesus Jesus. They would have called him Yeshua, which is, funnily enough, the same Old Testament name as Joshua, right? So you should be thinking of a connection. Okay, so you're wanting us to name him after that dude from the Old Testament. Joshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, what's the connection? Okay, well, Joshua is this dude that takes over from Moses, which that might be an interesting point in and of itself, but I'll park that. And he, his job is to bring judgment on the ungodly people in the world and to bring God's people into the land. Right? See a connection there? So what's Jesus going to do on the last day when he returns? He's going to bring judgment all of those who don't know him, and he brings us into the land. So Jesus is the greater Joshua. So when we read Joshua, you should be thinking, oh, there's a cooler version of this coming. Jesus Christ. Think about as well um, the, the, the nativity story. What happens when Christ is born? Well, one thing you'll notice here is there's like this maniacal, insane king trying to bring about his death. And as you're reading that, you should, probably should be thinking in terms of some connections there. Like, is there someone else? Like, Significant guy, Old Testament, he's a little kid, and there's some rules that he has to die because they're trying to kill all the male boys because of what this, you know, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Sounds like the Exodus, right? It's like, it's just phenomenal how it lines up. You're like, is that, is that an accident? Is it an accident that Matthew's bringing that up? Surely it's not. Other, you'll notice that other Gospels don't even bring up the Nativity story. So why, why is he spending so much time on this? Um, it's not obviously less than the fact that this has literally happened and he's trying to give a... a account of it, but I think it's more than that. I think he's trying to make a connection. Um, Matthew 2.15, uh, Matthew quotes Hosea, um, because you'll know in the story that Jesus, after running from here, goes into Egypt, and um, then eventually, after this king has died, comes back with his family into the land, and Matthew quotes a prophet from Hosea, oh, sorry, quotes a prophecy from Hosea, not even so much a prophecy as much as he's just saying some facts about Israel's origin in Egypt. And then Matthew takes that quote, you can see it there in Matthew 2.15, and he applies it to Christ. So it's originally about Israel's exodus from Egypt into the land, and he applies that to Christ. So what's he doing there? I think what he's trying to do is draw a parallel between Christ and Israel. Christ is the greater Israel. Christ is the servant who is doing what Israel is supposed to do. Um, Matthew 4 verse 2, he's in the wilderness led by the Spirit for 40 days. Okay, is there any other time in Scripture where there's a wilderness and a desert and 40? And yeah, I think it's doing the same thing there. Again, I think he's trying to draw a parallel between Moses and the Israelites and, and Christ himself. Is it accidental as well that um, Matthew depicts Jesus on a mountain giving his law? I mean, throughout the ministry of Christ, he would have done this over and over and over again. New Testament scholars like to bring this up, that it's not like just the Sermon on the Mount happened one time in one place. Why is it that Matthew's account of it is on the mountain? I think he's trying to draw a parallel. I think he's trying to say, here's the greater Moses. Moses has his law, comes down from the mountain. I think here's Jesus on the mountain giving his law. Additionally, why does Jesus have 12 disciples? Why not four? Why not 13? Why not really big crew? It's just, there's 12. I think there's something trying to be said there. And the last one is, if you look in Matthew 12, there's this really interesting story about how on the Sabbath, Jesus is picking grain um, with his disciples. Do you know the story? And the Pharisees have a big scrap of about how you can't do that on the Sabbath. What's your deal? Stop breaking the law. And instead of Jesus, a lot of people miss this. Instead of Jesus just saying, look, I'm God. I can do what I want. Or I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I can pick grain. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus goes into typology. He, he says, he, he brings up two stories, and, and there's um, parallels of this in the other Gospels as well. He, drew, he brings up a story of um, David and his kingly role, 
while he was on the run from Saul, and he says, look, David, grab some food here from um, the temple, and that would have normally been a big no-no, but because of, I guess, the significance of who he was and, and God's role and God's purpose for him, uh, it wasn't a sin for him, for David to do that. And he says, someone greater than David is here. I'm the greater David, I'm the true David. And then he gives another example, he said, also, the priests minister on the Sabbath, right? And the priests do their thing on the Sabbath all the time. And they work in the temple, and then Jesus says, someone greater than the temple is here. So, so the reason that I'm exempt from your charges of breaking the Sabbath is not because, I guess, normally, if I was a normal person, I would be, but because I'm special, um, I'm not. What he's saying is, I am the greater David. I'm the greater temple. And so all of um, the significance of who they were, surely that is fulfilled in me even more. So for me and my squad to be eating on the Sabbath from, from this grain is, is okay. Jesus is the greater temple and, and the greater David. So there's just a few examples of um, where that is done. So I'm over time. I'll stop uh, right before or after I do a little time to say, please come back next time. Because basically what we're going to do is I've got a whole bunch of scripture references. I'm going to just pop them around. And you'll be able to spend like maybe, I don't know, five minutes might be generous on different spots. And I just want you to look up passages and just think and just have a little bit of a wonder and question of, okay, what's the connection here? What's the relationship between these two? It should be really good. Um, I'm looking forward to having some conversations with you. And hopefully you'll be a little bit more confident to talk and a little bit more of a rowdy bunch next time. And um, we'll finish it off with a bit of a yarn together. So please come back, but enjoy your break for however long it is. Okay, Shalane.